Good evening. Welcome. I'm John. I'm the event director at Literati Bookstore. We're pleased to welcome Martha S. Jones in support of Vanguard. Tonight, she'll be in conversation with U of M professor Lakeisha Simmons. Uh, first, uh, one more over, overview of our webinars. The chat is closed, but you may want to keep the chat window open during the event as I'll be dropping links to purchase Vanguard from Literati Bookstore. And if you are joining us later uh, watching on YouTube, there is a link uh, in the description below to purchase books from our store as well. You can submit questions for the Q&A using the Q&A feature available to you in this webinar at any time. Uh, please, whenever you feel compelled to write a question, feel free to submit it through that Q&A feature, and I will read a, a selection of the, those questions at the conclusion of the conversation this evening. As a reminder, you can shop for more books at literatibookstore.com. Thousands of titles are available for curbside pickup if you live in Southeast uh, Michigan area. And in lieu of book purchase, we do also ask that you consider a $5 donation to sustain our virtual programming, whether you'd like to think of that as a subscription for this week or the month of November or for the remainder of the year, um, you can make donations at literatibookstore.com slash donation. Otherwise, we simply thank you for your attendance this evening or this morning or this afternoon, uh, depending on where and when in the world you may be joining us from. Uh, so without further ado, I'll introduce our author and our moderator this evening. Martha S. Jones is the Society of Black Alumni, Presidential Professor and Professor of History at Johns Hopkins University. She's president of the Berkshire Conference of Women Historians, the oldest and largest association of women historians in the United States. And she sits on the executive board of the Organization of American Historians. Author of Birthright Citizens and All Bound Up Together, she has written for the Washington Post, The Atlantic, USA Today, and more. She lives in Baltimore, Maryland. Lakeisha Simmons is the Associate Professor of History and Women's Studies at the University of Michigan. She's the author of Crescent City Girls, The Lives of Young Black Women in Segregated New Orleans, which won the SAWH Julia Cherry Spurrell Prize for Best Book in Southern Women's History and received honorable mention for the ABWH Letitia Woods Brown Memorial Book Award for the Best Book in African-American Women's History. Uh, they are unable to hear you, but they can sense it in spirit. So please join me uh, at home in uh, uh, clapping and welcoming uh, Keisha Simmons and Martha Jones into your living rooms. Good evening, everyone. Good evening. So I think Martha, you're gonna begin with a reading from the introduction. Yeah. Um, first of all, thanks so much to Literati, one of my absolute favorite bookstores in the entire world. Um, thank you to you, um, Keisha, for um, sharing an hour with me tonight to talk about Vanguard. Um, I'm really um, honored to be home in Ann Arbor. Um, my only regret is that we won't be headed to nights when this is all done. <laughs> So um, I do want to start with a little reading, if I could. Um, and just to set it up, you know, one of the things about writing this book was that as I was finishing, I realized I really needed to know more about my own family and how the women in my family fit into this story. Um, it, my encounters with them, mostly through the archives um, and where they were and what they did um, in this long saga around Black women and voting rights um, really changed the way I told the story. So um, I'm gonna share one bit about um, my great grandmother, um, Fannie Williams. Um, and this is a story, um, I discovered it among some old newspaper clippings. Fannie completed her studies at Berea College in 1888, nothing short of a triumph. During commencement, President Edward Henry Fairchild remarked of Fanny, in all of my experience of teaching for 38 years, I've never had a better student than you. Remember that you were admitted to the circle of all those who have attained the title of Bachelor of Arts, and you will everywhere be welcomed within that circle by all, except a very few who are blinded by an ungodly prejudice. With that, she was on her way to make good of the good use of the talent and ambition that Berea had encouraged. Fanny soon headed to her own classroom, assuming duties as a teacher with fresh pedagogy and bright polish. Fanny had also acquired a taste for entertainment or at least aimed to develop one. 
In 1889, she set off on a January evening to the local theater in Pulaski, Kentucky, just south of Berea. The schedule included a free Indian show, an evening of lectures on the history, culture, and medicines of Native Americans. Admission was gratis. The company earned its dollars by the sale of ointments, pills, and other remedies. Fanny entered the hall without trouble. She surveyed the room and spied a seat that was to her liking. Perhaps she was feeling a special sense of equality that her recent triumph at Berea had fueled. Maybe her mood was contrary, leading her to challenge the rules that told her she was less than. Fanny crossed the theater, approached a road designated for white patrons only, and quietly took a seat. I can imagine her there as she smoothed her skirt, placed down her purse, folded her hands in her lap, and waited. Even before segregation became baked into the laws of Kentucky, theater operators patrolled the color line on alert for those who might cross it. First an usher noticed Fanny. He approached and as Fanny explained, went to her in a gruff manner and ordered her to move. Immediately a contest of wills flared. Fanny with her sense of dignity and entitlement on one side and the usher on the other, adamant that a black woman, even a respectable one must be put in her place. Fanny ignored him and remained firmly seated with her back erect and her eyes fixed straight ahead until a local marshal arrived. He repeated the usher's admonition. Fanny retorted. She asked him politely to tell her why she was not allowed to sit where she was. She didn't think that she was harming anyone by sitting there. Her words were both a query and a challenge. What happened next might suggest that Fanny had studied law rather than classics at Berea. The marshal repeated his order. She was to move across the aisle to the colored section. Why was she being ordered to move? By what authority? By whose power? Papers later reported that Fanny denounced the marshal in strong terms, though she never devolved into the use of indecent or profane language. A confrontation of words turned physical when the marshal, fed up with Fanny's challenge to his authority, caught her roughly by the arm and led her to the door. In the days that followed, officials charged her with disorderly conduct, a mark that might have threatened her future as a teacher. She sought advice from friends who counseled that she pay the fine and costs to resolve the dispute. And she did, though all the while maintaining that the blame lay with the men whose gruffness had provoked her flash of temper. This was such an important story for me to recover from the life of Fanny Williams, in part because it's that moment when the marshal puts his hand on her um, that I think really captures so much of what is at stake in this book. Um, what I had never expected to recover again and again and again um, was the violence to which black women were subjective in the public square, in the theater, on the streets, on street cars and railroads. I never had understood fully how the struggle with those indignities um, and that wanton violence oftentimes really was what profoundly animated their uh, drive for voting rights. It's a circumstance that I think you know, even the great Frederick Douglass never really understood uh, that what black women were asking for, what they demanding. And it certainly wasn't um, a concern that white suffragists um, could respond to because in fact, white suffragists were the witnesses, right? Who stood passively by as someone like Fanny was ejected from a theater and it's Ida B. Wells was ejected from a train car, Sojourner Truth roughed up and, and um, declined a seat on a streetcar in Washington, DC. Um, so for me, um, finding this story very much helped me find my way in this book. Um, and I think like so many of us are, and just, just tremendously indebted um, to the women who left that record so that we could understand better um, how, we got from there um, to here. So thanks again, Keisha, for letting me do that. Um, she knows I've been thinking a lot about writing. And so this is a way for me to reconnect with the book in that way. So thank you. I think it's a beautifully written book and um, gorgeous introduction, the way that you are able to weave 
family history into this larger story. I wonder what it was like for you to find that article um, and kind of hold that story in your hands. It was really a story about police brutality. Yeah, I, um, you know, I am in my family, um, the keeper or one of the keepers, right, of the memory. I'm the keeper of the papers when you don't want them. I find a corner for them in my basement. You know, I, I'm very much that person, which, you know, sometimes gives you a false sense that you know everything. Mm -hmm. Part of what was remarkable about, about this is that I'd heard many stories about my great grandmother. She was beloved, she was admired, um, but this story no one told. And that is also, I think, part of our work, right, is going to those places where um, understandably, we have been reluctant to go places that are painful to go and places that are so um, profoundly resonant with our own time, right? It, they feel, if not quite timeless, um, they, they have a, a, a kind of thread that we can see kind of running through the 1880s and um, all the way through to 2020. And police violence, I think, is one of those threads. Yes, I was, um, I was thinking about, I mean, there's so many of those threads in the book for me. Um, and one of them that, that relates in a way to this conversation is um, the first part of the book, you take us back to prior to the 19th Amendment. And you have us thinking about how Black women have to fight in order to assume power in um, public. And I think those are like a really key piece is that public part. What does it mean to be powerful in public? And um, you tell a story of Susan Paul and Sarah Maps Douglas who um, go to a woman's meeting and you say, uh, and there was mob violence there. And you say, just being at a woman's political gathering could expose them to violence. Um, and so I'm wondering if you can talk a little bit about what that kind of public violence means for women who try to be powerful in public um, and black women in particular. I think that um, this 1838 women's anti-slavery meeting in Philadelphia, I think is um, oftentimes been narrated as um, uh, an important moment in a kind of sisterhood between black and white women um, in the early 19th century and a kind of an exceptional moment. And then when I spent time in the coverage, the reporting, the commentary, um, it becomes clear that black and white women don't really stand in the same shoes and that the real irritant, right? There's a lot that's um, unorthodox and there's a lot that's provocative about that meeting. It is a meeting called by women, run by women. It's a big meeting. It is highly visible. Um, it is an anti-slavery meeting. Um, so layered on top of the women gathering publicly is the pro provocation of abolitionism. And still, um, when it comes down to negotiating and trying to quell the mob, the request comes and the request is just that let the black women stay home. And, you know, we talk a lot in black women's um, history and black women's studies about the body. Um, and I consider myself, you know, a, a student of, you know, our great feminist theorists like Hortense Spillers who call our attention to um, the body as a site of politics or Brittany Cooper's, um, you know, more recent um, meditations on the role of the body. And I kept seeing the bodies again and again and again, right? Not as abstractions, not as ideas, um, but it is the physical, the physicality and how black women don't have to say a word, right? In order to provoke a mob, right? And, to, and the end of the story, as you know, is the burning, right? of Pennsylvania Hall in Philadelphia. It's not simply a mob, it is mob violence um, that is meted out on the meeting place, is meted out on the bodies of women. Um, and I had never, I had never heard those details in quite that way until I 
went back to the record myself, thinking about the, the stakes um, for Black women in what it means to be in public, even before you're claiming things like the right to vote, right, or hold public office. Um, here in an anti-slavery meeting, you are the provocation. Yeah, and I think part of it too is just that um, to be at the meeting is also the um, that not just claiming of space, but claiming of I have something to say on this. Um, and so I think that's that's a lot of what the women in the first part of the book are really doing. They're stepping forward to say, you know, I have a voice and an opinion in this. Um, and so it's it's pretty amazing to see them really fight for that, um, despite the violence that they're often met with. Um, I wanna ask you about Frances Ellen Watkins Harper. Oh. Chapter four is titled, um, Great Bundle of Humanity. And so you quote Frances Ellen Watkins Harper and you, you quote her, she says, we are all bound up together in one great bundle of humanity, which you call a fierce reframing of, an, of American politics. Um, so for those who don't know, you use part of that quotation in the title of one of your other books. And so I know you love it. <laughs> um, so I want to know what moves you so much about this particular quotation about Frances Ellen Watkins Harper's life work, because um, I know it's special to you. Wow, well, thank you for that. It's true. Um, uh, I have been known to call myself a Harperian, um, which is to say, I'm not a Marxist, I'm a Harperian. You know, that the, the political philosophy, the theory, the worldview of Harper um, really has long resonated powerfully with me. Um, and I think that, um, you know, when I first came to her, um, uh, I had benefited from, you know, our colleague and friend, um, Melba Boyd and um, her work um, on Frances Harper and many of the literary scholars. Um, Harper was a poet. Um, so she's hard not to be drawn to for, um, you know, the, the elegance and the, you know, of her, her, her capacity with the language alone makes her someone who is extraordinary to read. Um, but for a political historian, um, there she is in some of the most fraught scenes of the 1860s after the Civil War. Um, there's a constitutional revolution going on. You know, who is going to get voting rights? Is it Black men? Is it white women? Is it somebody else? And that story. I was in a meeting just this morning where somebody told that story as if Frances Ellen Watkins Harper hadn't been there at all. Mm -hmm. um, so by the time I come back to her, now I'm just clear, right, that we're going to double down. Because why? Because she's somebody who really uh, sets out uh, not only a political vision, um, but sets a political high bar for the country, which is when we're say, we are all bound up together in one great bundle of humanity. It is a plea, right, for her allies to resist racism, yes, to resist sexism, um, to understand that Black women live at the intersection of those two. Um, and then, in fact, the best measure of the work of that coalition will be how women like Frances Ellen Watkins Harper fare, right, in, an, in the new United States that's being wrought by um, the Civil War and Reconstruction. Um, so I love her because she's a visionary. I love her because she understands language and words. I think she's um, remarkable in this period because um, she knows how to sort of thread the needle which is, uh, in politics, which is to say, she can speak fiercely and somehow the commentators still write, you know, she was the epitome of sort of <laughs> womanhood. And, and, and I think that's fascinating, you know, that, that I couldn't do that, frankly. And, and I think that's fascinating. Um, so, um, but I think in this moment when we are, um, I think many of us trying to understand and understand better 
um, Black women's politics in the 21st century, um, to revisit those moments without Frances Harper is really a missed opportunity for us to appreciate how she's actually helping to set a foundation um, that figures who we know well, I'll choose to Stacey Abrams, right, are still working on and through in many ways. Um, and I think she doesn't get credit for that all the time. Yeah, and it makes me wonder what, um what she has to tell us for our time today, like the, you know, less than a week before an election that feels weighty um, because it is weighty, that what it means to say we're one great bundle of humanity and mean it. Yeah, I think, you know, um, I've been thinking about that refrain a lot in the, in the time of COVID, if you will, mm -hmm. because, you know, in some ways, while COVID has had um, disparate impacts and not everyone has been situated in the same way in front of the disease. It has been sort of one of those leveling experiences and we are still being leveled by it. <clears throat> and in a sense, I think Watkins Harper knows that, right? It, you know, knows that sense that, um, that a great deal of what we imagine distinguishes us as human beings is, is false, is constructed, is even pernicious. And race and sex are foremost in her analysis um, when it comes to that. But the thing I love about Harper is that what she tells us about politics is you gotta get in the trenches, right? You gotta, and she's a, she's a lecturer, which is and a traveling lecturer, which is terribly risky. And she recounts, you know, her own, um, narrow escapes from assault and more um, on the road. Um, she's in the trenches, in the meetings, in the meeting halls, in the debates. But at the same time, she reminds us, you've got to always hold on to your highest ideals, right? Mm -hmm. Don't cede your highest ideals just because politics is, you know, messy and dangerous and more. Um, and I think the notion, I think sometimes that we feel like we have, it's an either or proposition, right? Either you're in the trenches and you're pragmatic and all that, um, or you are someone who is, you know, philosophical and high-minded. And I think she's both. Um, and I think her record, you know, sort of shows us that she's both. And I feel like that's a real lesson for now, right? That here we are in a season where, you know, if you haven't already done it, folks, plan your vote, right? All, mm -hmm. of, all of that. We're seeing the voter suppression, the long lines, the intimidation, all of that. And we have to be engaged right there where it's happening. And still, I think, we can and should um, be asking ourselves, what are our aspirations? I was listening to a radio podcast this morning um, and they were interviewing um, young Latinx first time voters. And, you know, these are young people speaking to us about their dreams. And I think Harper would encourage us to hold on to our dreams, even in moments that feel, you know, desperate and dire. Um, and uh, that means a lot to me because I am one part dreamer um, and one part rough and tumble in the trenches, I think, in my own politics. It also seems like I, I, I like how you brought us to this moment of COVID and its um, interdependence because it seems like part of what you're saying about her reframing American politics is saying that American politics isn't just about freedom and independence it's actually about interdependence. And that's a totally different way of seeing the world um, that, that you bring us to that, that quotation um, that seems so important. Um, I think I wanna ask you now about Mary McLeod Bethune, who um, I think I don't give enough attention to in my own work. I, I was reading your book and I was like, oh man, why have I ignored her? Um, but, Firstly, the story in, uh, of her in the 1920s, like trying to go vote, amazing. Um, but she also, so um, she, I don't, I can't describe her. I'll let you do that. But after she passed away, she published, well, she gave to Ebony to publish her last will and testament. And I just want to quote what you say, she says in that, she's, she tried to work with a commitment to, quote, faith, courage, brotherhood, dignity, 
ambition, and responsibility. So I wanted you to talk a little bit about her, um, but maybe focus in on that ambition part, because that really struck me as to like be a Black woman and say, I've been ambitious. Um, to me was a, and you know, after you've already gone, to me is a staking a claim for yourself that that is, takes courage. I guess there's the having ambition and then there's the, um, I'm going to tell you that I have ambition, right? Um, which we saw not so many weeks ago, um, uh, Stacey Abrams caught in that vice, right? Abrams, who has been very forthcoming about her political ambitions or, you know, would she be vice president? Yes. Might she run? For, absolutely. Right. And, and the backlash against that, right? Um, maybe not for simply possessing it, but then having the audacity to say it out loud. And it's hard to imagine someone like Bethune, um, you know, who begins her life, you know, the daughter of formerly enslaved people, um, a large family of farmers, the first in her family to um, have the opportunity to go to school. Um, what short of like audacious ambition, right? gets you from there to the founding of the United Nations right? um, in 1945. Um, and so um, Bethune is one of the, when I was a kid, um, Bethune was a character in my household because um, she was someone my grandfather had known and um, she had um, extended great um, great favors to him in his work life. And, um, and so she was someone who I had heard of, if you know what I mean, in this very um, powerful way, but I, she was not someone I had studied. And I think she's, I think she's terribly understudied. I don't understand why Mary McLeod Bethune. So Bethune is, you know, the child of Southern farmers in South Carolina who has the audacity to migrate to Florida. And by the dawn of the 20th century, she's founded a industrial school for girls, which is today Bethune-Cookman University. Um, she is a suffragist um, of the first order who um, organizes in the face of Ku Klux Klan violence and intimidation in Florida in the 1920s. By the 30s is in Washington helping Franklin Roosevelt establish um, his black cabinet and meeting out patronage favors in Washington for black Americans. And by 1945, she, uh, she wrangles um, out of Mrs. Roosevelt um, the opportunity to be one of the three black delegates to the founding of the United Nations in 1945. It's an extraordinary, extraordinary life. Um, and she was the hardest person one of the hardest people to write about because Mary McLeod Bethune knows it. Talk about like ambition and audacity, she knows it. And so her archives are filled with um, her self-constructed myths. Um, and it was really a, 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 a labor to try and, you know, just push aside enough of the myth to understand what actually happened, which is kind of where we are as historians at least begin. Um, and uh, I understand why she doesn't have a biography because mm -hmm. I think it's really formidable. So she was that formidable. She not only knew how to do the work, she knew how to create myths around herself, which I think is part of politics. Right? So yes. Not disrespectfully, but if you don't know how to create a narrative around yourself, you know, create some really good stories, right? About where you come from and what you've done, who your people are. Um, it's hard to make headway in American politics. And she, including these stories about confrontations with the Ku Klux Klan, which did happen, um, even if they didn't happen exactly the way she told them. Um, these are, this is part of her politics, is creating a persona, right? Who is Mrs. Mary McLeod Bethune. Um, and, um, you know, kudos to the historian who can wade through that. You know, the other thing about Bethune is that she knows we're coming. She knows historians are coming. She knows that we're gonna write about her. Um, and she's gonna try and, you know, just set it up well enough that you'll feel compelled to tell the story that she wants you to tell um, and, uh, and get her the way she wants to be remembered. That's, that's some formable stuff for somebody, at least for somebody like me um, to take on, right? That we know that there's a lot of myth-making 
about black women figures, but she was my first encounter with a black woman figure who, who self-consciously deliberately over decades constructed her own myths. I, I got to give it to her. <laughs> I do too. And I have to give it to you for identifying that that is the politics of her. And it reminds me of all, I mean, politicians now they write autobiographies in order to create these myths so that they can later run for president. <laughs> and it's now that's the thing that you do, but it's almost like she's in that act as she's going and it's part of what's helping her um, gather power, you know, and make herself bigger than life. Cause to be, um, you know, a woman and black in this period and having the power that she does is, is extraordinary. And, you know, and Mrs. Bethune does not have, you know, what we might deem to be the kind of pedigree, right, that makes her obviously um, a club woman, right, obviously someone in this cadre of women, you know, many of whom were um, elitely educated, many of whom were light skinned, and more. Um, Mrs. Bethune is none of those things. Um, and yet, say her ambition and her talent and her brilliance, I think really um, take her far, but she under, she's the best politician in the book, I think, by far. You've made me feel really bad about ignoring her. <laughs> I mean, especially because I write about girls and she. You know, one of the things about this book is that I wanted to write about people who had been written about a bit so that if someone captured your imagination, there were other places to go to read about them on the one hand, and at the same time, if someone captures your imagination and you want to write about them, there's likely still more to do. And I think she's a perfect example of someone who really, um, that biography will be phenomenal. Well, I love the way um, that you've, you framed her story. Um, and I, I, I guess I can ask a follow-up question of, about this question of ambition. Um, I want to ask you as, as a lawyer, well, somebody with a law degree, I don't know if you self-identify as a lawyer, <laughs> um, a historian, a writer, um, how you feel, like what is your relationship to that word ambition? Um, I know for me, it, it, it was a complicated journey to like capture that and say, you know, it's something that I, that's not bad. Um, so I just, I'm, Wondering how you think about that as, as a professional Black woman in the world today, um, which, you know, I think it's still a struggle. I think it is a struggle. And I think um, there are many years in my life where I would say, you know, I kept my ambition, you know, close to the vest, as they say. Um, and, um, and it really was other Black women historians who created enough space for me to kind of let those desires or blossom in my own mind and begin to speak them out loud. Um, so, you know, you and I are both, um, I think, proud members of the Association of Black Women's Historians and that space and, and our sister scholars in that space who are uh, so remarkable um, really gave me a kind of permission, a kind of license, a kind of place to be with that ambition where no longer was it um, something to be, you know, kept secret and no longer was it something to um, uh, kind of cover up, um, but it was something I could sort of um, own and, um, and it changed my work, right? It changed my mm -hmm. work, um, which is to say, um, you know, once you kind of admit and you in, indulge a bit your ambition, you discover there were things you aspire to do, things you can do that you didn't really know you could. And I think mm -hmm. that, so for me, this book um, is very much the journey of this book is partly me um, realizing that um, I really like talking to people who aren't historians about history, for example. And so in order to do that, you got to write books that you hopefully people beyond our immediate circles want to read. Um, you have to learn how to write in ways that are sort of engaging and compelling and hold people's attention. Um, and then you have to be willing to have something to say, I think beyond the, um, the ins and outs of historical method or argument. And 
um, one of the challenges in this book uh, was that I was scared to write into the 20th century because um, while you are a formidable <laughs> historian of a more recent past, I am not. And, um, and it was my editor, frankly, you know, who said, you've got to come all the way up to 1965, I got up all the way to present, in fact, <laughs> lots of people. And, um, and I discovered that maybe I could take a shot at that and see how I did. Well, I feel like there, firstly, I just, I agree. I mean, I feel like people maybe used to call me ambitious and I thought it was an insult, mm -hmm. you know? And I agree that the space of Association of Black Women Historians is one place where you feel like you can be fully yourself um, and it just reminds me of the women in your book who, who start their own clubs because they don't feel at home in white suffragist clubs, or they feel like their concerns won't be met. And so it's the, that like sister space where they feel like, oh, here's a place where I can be. I can only be, I can, I can actually, you know, wrestle with other women about ideas, about power, about politics and more, right? It doesn't mean we're gonna all agree. Yeah, yeah. But, it, it, but it, that is, isn't that the ultimate expression of ambition, right? When you sort of move toward leadership and then it turns out you disagree with, you know, the folks maybe you respect the most. Um, and there's a lot of that in this book too, I think. Yeah, oh, that's so awesome. Um, I want to ask this question because it's something that comes up a lot in teaching, but I think also people have been talking about it um, around, you know, when Hillary Clinton was running for president, as well as with the um, um, comm commemoration around the 19th Amendment. And you hear a lot of um, Black women, students who maybe say, you know, that's not my history. I don't care about the 19th Amendment or, you know, su you know, suffragists, um, because that's all white women stuff. And so I'm wondering when when you hear that, um, you know, from students or from people, what what is your answer to that? Well, the first thing is, is to. Um reframe that a bit as one of the myths, right, that surround this history, right? The, the myth that either all women got the vote in 1920 or no black women got the vote or both somehow, you know, both of those things, you know, kind of get thrown out there as true, which of course they could not be. Um, so it's to frame that as one of the myths um, that has um, worked, I think, to distance black women um, from the past and present, right? From um, the practice and the stakes in American politics. Mm. Um, now, it was, you know, our, um, one of our great um, founders of ABWH and the historian, Dr. Rosalind Turborg Penn, um, whose, her book was the first book I read about the history of women's suffrage. And it was a history about black women, um, where they were and where they were not and the experience of racism within that movement. So we have to acknowledge that that movement narrowly construed is not a very comfortable, compatible, productive space for black women. And if you go looking for black women in suffrage associations, um, you will not find them in great numbers because that's not where they were. And I hope that's one of the contributions of this book is that um, I try and redirect our attention to the places where black women were, whether it's in churches or civil rights organizations, clubs, anti-slavery societies and more um, that when we follow black women to where they gather, where they work on ideas, where they organize and more, um, they're nearly always going to break out into some discussion about their rights as women. Um, and yet um, they're going to have to build a movement among themselves that is distinct from what we oftentimes think of as the stock story. This is not a book that begins in 1848 at that Seneca Falls, New York meeting, um, because there are no black women there. You know, and instead, I take you, I hope, to Philadelphia, where Black women are gathered and they are talking about rights. And similarly, it's not a book that can end in 1920 with ratification of the 19th Amendment because Black women 
too many black women do not get the vote in 1920, despite a federal amendment, Jim Crow laws and violence will keep them from the polls. So once we introduce with a seriousness black women and we go to where they are, we listen to their ideas, we watch what they do, um, it's a different kind of history um, than the stock narrative. And I hope with that, right, I can persuade my own students. And I should say, I wrote this book with my students and <laughs> at least they told me they were persuaded. I don't know, you know how students are. They're generous and uh, it, it, to a fault. But um, to my students, um, to our students, um, the best compliment I've gotten on this book is when somebody tells me um, their mother read it or their niece read it or their granddaughter read it. And, um, and then I think maybe we too are ready for these stories and from this perspective and to claim a history that is distinctly ours in the great saga of American politics rather than trying to wedge ourselves into other people's histories. And that is an uncomfortable place that I too would reject. Um, but I do think that you know, partly we write books to make space, you know, for um, other kinds of histories. And I, and I hope people can see some of themselves, you know, in their foremothers in the stories I tell. I think for me, it was, it was kind of surprising, in fact, the, um, the kinds of voter mobilization that was happening both prior to the 19th Amendment and after, especially, um, in the South where, you know, I had ass assumed, uh, you know what they say about that, but, <laughs> um, you know, I had thought a lot about black women voting in the West or in the North, um, but, you know, to still be going out there in the 1920s and saying, let's prepare ourselves to register to vote, even knowing what was coming for them, um, takes a whole lot of um, bravery, um, and so I think it has a, it gives us a lot of lessons for today where we're facing, you know, um, disenfranchisement, voter intimidation, and I think also disillusionment with the political parties um, that, that kind of like stubbornness, yeah. you know, deep stubbornness that says, you say, I can't do this, but I can. It's so important, I, I think, for how we reflect on this moment, right? Which is that the women I write about come into the moment of the 19th Amendment knowing so many of them that they're not gonna be able to vote, right? They know that law and violence are gonna keep them from voting, but that does not stop them, right? From challenging um, and being in the faces of registrars and city officials and more in that moment um, so what's going on there? Um, it is, I think, courage. I think it is that audacity. Um, but the lesson for us is, right, they don't sit down. And, you know, the women I write about don't sit down. They don't go home. Um, they don't wait for someone to, um, from some distant, you know, hall of lawmaking like Congress, um, bequeath to them finally the right to vote. Um, they get very, very busy. Um, and, um, and that's a story that, you know, takes us all the way to 19, it takes 45 years from 1920 to get to 1965 in the Voting Rights Act. And there's a lot of important history, including the modern civil rights movement um, that gets us to um, fuller voting rights for black Americans in that year. Um, but these are women who don't sit down and wait for that. And I think that they, clearly know um, many of them what a protracted struggle that is. Um, you know, they have memories of the disenfranchisement of black men in the early part of the 19th century. You know, they remember Pennsylvania and New York and how black men lost the vote in those states in early America. Um, so these are not women who are naive right, about the vagaries, about the inequalities, about the ups and downs when it comes to voting rights. Um, but they all know that it, there's no substitute, right, for doing the work in all kinds of ways. And, um, you know, I like to think of it, and I think this is, takes me back to Fannie Williams, right? You know, 
Fanny Williams did the work so that I could do the work, right, in my own lifetime. She didn't do the work because she was going to cure all that ailed, you know, American politics or culture or law or anything else. I don't think she was that naive about the formidability of the obstacles, um, but she definitely was laying the foundation and bequeathing to us, right, strategies, tactics, ideas, ideals, and more. Um, and that has helped me, uh, you know, in this season, right, to find a way to continue to do good work in the face of what feels like, you know, formidable obstacles. Thank you. That's, that's so wonderful. And I think um, a great way of thinking about how these histories connect with our um, everyday. I think maybe we should have time for a question from the Q&A. Yeah, we have um, a few questions um, and um, a comment as well. I'll just start with a comment, which is um, thank you to Professor Jones for quote unquote, coming home and spending time with us in Ann Arbor. Hello from your friend, Judy. Um, and um, the first question we have is, uh, what were some of the most influential primary source collections that you found while doing research for the book? Yeah, thank you for that. Um, one of the things that was very important to me in writing this book was to let the voices of the women about whom I was writing come through as much as possible. Um, and I think there's a kind of, um, there's a wisdom that's a little bit of a myth um, about black women's history, which is that there's not enough there, right? The records don't exist. You can't write that, but it's not true. I, I want to say, of course it's true, you know, in some sense and in another sense, it's not true. And, um, I went back to sources that I knew well, and then I got into the 20th century and I was like, a, oh, <laughs> those, you know, the, the you know, Mary Church Terrells, the Ida B. Wells, the Mary McLeod Bethunes. These are women who know they are going to be the subject of history writing. They write their own memoirs. They preserve their own papers. And so I was awash in material in the 20th century um, in ways that was um, mind blowing to me. I now understand why so many of my colleagues work in the 20th century. <laughs> sense, right? It's just, oh, you know, I'm going over the same old material in the 19th century, which is still fascinating to me. Um, but now there are boxes instead of folders to go through and it's pretty um, exciting. Um, so I think that um, this broad lesson, right, which is that in fact, black women do leave a record um, and that part of our work is to understand the sorts of records that they leave. You know, how am I going to include enslaved women um, in a book like this? Well, there's a figure like Harriet Jacobs who pens a, a, a memoir, Incidents in the Life of a Slave Girl, which speaks in really important ways to the questions that animate this movement. Um, and then there are women like um, Celia, an enslaved woman in rural Missouri who leaves you know, a paragraph that to us of her own words, but leaves her actions that we can appreciate can be folded into this story. Um, and um, so I think that it's in some sense, our obligation to be, to develop the ability to hear um, because I think the, that women do leave us the records that we need, at least to write this kind of history. It also seems like in your other work and in, in this one, um, that you're tracing black women in political space and in, in political public spaces. And so one of the things that I really liked was um, some of the voting organizations and mobilizations that you trace in the teens and 20s in the South, um, which I hadn't really read a lot before, despite doing 20th century Southern history. It seems like you're doing a lot of that through following these women who are in our public figures and following them through newspaper traces and all these things um, that I think you do so well. Well, I and mean, that's the other thing is that, you know, as contrasted with some of my earlier work, I'm now writing a book um, fully in this moment where increasingly newspapers are digitized across a broad swath of the country. And that means 
and they're searchable, you know, and now you can really, um, you can follow someone like Francis Ellen Watkins Harper, right, from town to town, right, <laughs> week to week. Um, and that was something that I couldn't have done in my earlier work. Mm -hmm. that worked over that expanse of news reporting um, without these, um, these databases that are doing that work. So our work also changes in response to some of the, the digital technologies that undergird it. And I benefited from digital newspapers tremendously. Um, they're also just really fun to root around in. Do you still get to use the microfiche? Is that still uh, uh, part of the practice? I don't know about that. I, I, I am a veteran of the microfiche um, when I was <laughs> in graduate school, and, and this definitely will, like, you know, date me. Um, but I miss the microfiche, you know, because well, the great thing about microfiche and that kind of research that we, you know, we did back in the day was, you know, you just were in the bowels of the library somewhere and there was no, it was quiet, it was dark, you know, you were with your sources in this very, you know, curious, intimate way. Um, and of course, my students think that's ridiculous, but, uh, but it, there was something to it, I, I say, that I can still remember the microfiche machine I used in graduate school for what it's worth. Me now, too. <laughs> collector's item now or it's in a trash heap. I'm not sure which. Uh, I hope not. I also love them. Um, we have got, uh, time for one more question, I think. And it's, um, uh, were there any stories you really loved that you were unable to include in the book? Thank you for that. Thanks, Bethany. Thanks for being here. Um, yes. There were things that were left on the cutting room floor. Um, the most interesting of which was um, a piece about um, Charlotte Bass. And um, if that name sounds vaguely familiar to you, it's because um, Charlotte Bass, well, this is why it's familiar because when Kamala Harris was um, uh, accepted the Democratic nomination and was going to be the vice presidential candidate. Rachel Maddow came on MSNBC and said she's the first Black woman to run for the vice presidency. And I, my head exploded nearly because, of course, I had on my cutting room floor the story of Charlotte Bass, who was, in fact, the first Black woman to run for vice president, which she did in 1952 on the Progressive Party ticket. Um, and it turned out to be delightful because, um, for me, because um, that night at one o'clock in the morning, I was in my bathroom trying to keep my let my family sleep with a reporter from the Washington Post who had seen the tweets and wanted to do a piece on Charlotte Bass. And before we were done, the New York Times did one of those um, uh, obituaries for her um, overlooked, right? They come back to do obituaries of people who should have had obituaries in their own lifetimes. And they did a, they did a beautiful piece on Charlotte Bass. And so um, the lesson there is um, I was onto something with Charlotte Bass and I wasn't able to find a place for her in this book, um, but it was super, super proud that um, that research sort of didn't um, stay on the cutting room floor and wound up kind of woven into um, some of the um, uh, appreciation and, um, and beautiful writing about her that um, happened after um, she became associated, she became relevant in a whole new way um, in August of 2020. So uh, I always work with a, um, a discard file when I cut something from a chapter. I just dump it in another file saying, you never know when you'll get called on for this. And in that case, I literally was reading from, from my notes on the phone to a reporter and it was super satisfying. So thanks for that question. That's great. Um, and uh, we've reached the top of the hour. Um, so I think it's time to to go. But uh, we just want to thank um, both of you for being here tonight and for joining us at a, a Home with Literati to celebrate this wonderful book, which you can purchase at Literati Bookstore. It's available for curbside pickup if you live in Ann Arbor. You can pick it up tomorrow. Um, but uh, Martha S. Jones, Lakeisha Simmons, thank you so much for being here. We, we hope you both stay safe and be well. And as I said, before we went live, uh, we'd be delighted to have you for an official uh, in-person uh, book event and, and relaunch uh, for the paperback and, and celebrate um, 
then. Um, but until then, um, we, we hope you stay well. And to all of our guests, thank you for joining us tonight. Um, and thank you for supporting our bookstore. And uh, we hope to see you at the next event. So take care, everybody. Thank you. Thank Bye. you, Martha. Thank you, Keisha. Thank you, John. Thanks, Literati. We love you. Thank you. Take care, everyone. Bye.